the Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew, the 16th chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. Now, when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, Who do people say that the Son of Man is? And they said, Some say John the Baptist, but others Elijah, and still others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. Jesus said to them, But who do you say that I am? Simon Peter answered him, You are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered him, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father in heaven. And I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Then Jesus sternly ordered the disciples not to tell anyone that he was the Messiah, the Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Let us join our hearts in prayer. Holy God, as we've heard the reading of your word, as we've heard your message, open our hearts to receive the promise that's in your gospel, but also form us by it. Shape us to be who you have formed us to be in the beginning. Help us, O oh God. We offer this in Jesus' name. Amen. We are formed in many ways. A few moments ago, we had the back-to-school blessing because that's a part of that formation. We go into school and we learn and we're shaped and we grow and we become something more than we were. But there are other ways that we're formed too. I think sports is one of those things that is very formative for us. So, for example, for a moment, take a look at this. And, how about this one? Thank you to Sandra and to Stephen for helping out. Sports is formative. And I don't mean playing the game. Yes, it can be. But I don't know. I grew up in Ohio. And I'll tell you that in Ohio, elementary students learn in their music classes the Ohio State fight song. It's just one of the songs you automatically learn if you're in Ohio. In Ohio, you're being formed to become an Ohio State Buckeye. And everybody has scarlet and gray clothing. In these two examples that we had just a moment ago, they too do that. And one is formed so much by the team that they've come to love that they set aside time for it so that they watch the games. They pay attention to any news about it. For example, when the coach from the University of Houston was moved over to UT in Austin, there was all kinds of conversation on the news. You're moved to buy clothing of a certain color, you know, you might even be moved to buy a car in your team's colors. You've been formed to be a fan. But that's not the only way we're formed. When we go to school, we learn basics, reading, writing, arithmetic. We learn things so as to be formed, so we can think, so our minds are expanded and can live into the potential of what they can be. But so it is with faith also. Faith is not accidental. 
In the Gospel reading we heard just a few moments ago, it's a fascinating reading. You see, the disciples have been following Jesus for a while now. They have been looking to him as a rabbi. Remember that shows up now and then that they call him Rabboni, rabbi. They see him as a teacher. They're moved to want to follow him. They want to learn from him. Well, here's what they've been learning. He heals people who are sick. He has the power to cast out demons from people. He took a little bit of bread and fish and fed 5,000 people and they had plenty to eat and there were 12 baskets left over and that didn't count all the women and children. He walked on the water. He met them. They were in a boat. He walked out to them and he didn't sink. They have been witnessing, listening. He's been expanding their hearts and minds with a new way of understanding who God is and what God is up to. Now understand, these disciples were Jewish men. And Judaism had a structure to it. Judaism involved the temple in making animal sacrifices. And there, were, there was a rhythm to acts of atonement and asking for forgiveness and purity laws and all kinds of rules. And Jesus has been pushing them past those edges into something more. So now they've come to Caesarea Philippi. Now, interesting thing about Caesarea Philippi. This is, a, this is a town that has lots of deep Roman Empire Greek roots. And there is a temple there that is dedicated to the Greek god Pan. But at this temple, there are all kinds of niches where there are little resemblances of all these other gods. So it's a pantheastic center. Lots of different religious things going all over the place. And Jesus dares to ask his disciples right there, who do the people say I am? Well, goodness gracious, they've got every God that they could pick out of the, out of the collection. They could say anything. And they start talking about who they're hearing people say. One of the prophets, John the Baptist, they're, they don't know, but they're hearing this. But then Jesus asked them, these ones who have been following Jesus, who have been being formed, that's it guys, they're being formed by Jesus. Who do you say that I am? And Simon Peter, Simon Peter who's very often the mouthpiece for the disciples, he's the first one that we hear answering, you are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. Whoa! That's huge! The Jewish people have been waiting for Messiah for so long. And he says, that's what I see in you. Jesus then interacts with Peter with celebration. He's not denying it, he's affirming it. And then he says, I'm going to call you Peter, and on this rock, I'm going to build my church. The rock that he's talking about is the rock of faith. Faith, that utter trust in God. That utter trust in God that pushes everything else to the side. That utter trust in God that gives one the, the chutzpah, the inspiration, the strength to live through no matter what life may bring. That utter love of God, that trust of God, that God is good, that God is merciful, that God is gracious, and empowers one to live into that on this rock of faith, utter trust. I'm going to build my church in the gates of Hades. In other words, hell has no power over it. Now we know that these disciples are going to continue following Jesus in this path. It's a turning point in Matthew. 
and it's now heading toward what's going to take place in Jerusalem. And there, they're going to have a challenge yet. They are going to experience the death of Jesus on the cross. Their world seemingly crumbling down in, but they stay fast holding on, confused and scared, and what they experience is that greater revelation of God that God in Jesus Christ conquers sin, death, and the devil. On that rock of faith, these disciples will pledge their life. Formed by Jesus, formed by what they've experienced with Jesus, formed by the good news, formed by the cross and resurrection, these will dedicate their lives to that trust in God and they will dare to step out in faith. Peter will risk his life and will lose his life proclaiming the gospel of Jesus. They were formed into who they are as followers of Jesus. They were formed to be set free from sin, from the power of death, from all of the distractions, to live in and into the love of God, the mercy of God. I wish I could say that that was the end of the story and everything was hunky-dory and that from here on out was sunshine and rainbows. But here's the reality. Even from the early days, the church struggled with this. We humans struggle with that formation of trusting and living into what God has given us in Jesus. Remember that uh, Jesus said that Peter didn't get this by himself. It's rather a gift of God. God's the one who forms faith. God's the one who moves and encourages us. The church has struggled. St. Paul we heard from the 12th chapter of uh, Romans, his letter to the Roman church, which was made up of Jewish Christians and Gentile Christians in the capital of the empire. He raises the issue when he says, chapter 12, verse 2, Be ye not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. What he's trying to say is, don't be conformed to the ways of this world, the ways of sin, the ways of death, the ways that make us push some people to the side, trample down others, the ways of greed that says it's all about me, better get my own, One, the idea of valuing having more when others are suffering. Paul's saying, don't be conformed to the ways of this world. Don't be conformed and fall in line with what the rest of the world's doing. Instead, be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Think of heart and mind. Same as with metanoia, when we repent, it's a change of heart and mind. Be transformed into something more. And that something more is a follower of Jesus, not just on Sunday, but seven days a week lived out. The way of life of trusting Jesus with all that we are, and for what will yet be. Paul did that. Recall Paul? He was a Jewish persecutor of Christians. He encountered God. Jesus showed up. And he changed his life. His life was transformed by the Gospel and he became a proclaimer of Jesus and one of the most famous proclaimers of Jesus. But still, the church, the young church, still struggled. We hear of this issue coming up in a later part of the Bible, in the letter of First John. It talks about that conformity to this world versus the transformation, being formed to be who God created us to be. In 1 John 5, we hear, how does God's love abide in anyone who has the world's goods and sees a brother or sister in need and yet refuses help? Little children, 
let us love not in word or speech, but in truth and in action. And by this we will know that we are from the truth and will reassure our hearts before Him. We also hear God is love, and those who abide in love abide in God, and God abides in them. Love has been perfected among us in this, that we may have boldness on the day of judgment, because as He is, so we are in this world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. You see, we're called into a life of being formed by the Holy Spirit of God. Jesus' Spirit that we receive. Formed to be people of love and grace and mercy. People who see the world. Our worldview is one shaped by who is on the edge, who is vulnerable that needs my help. Shaped by looking at the world through love and grace and mercy and abundance. We are called into that kind of a life. Now, how that happens is just how it happened for the disciples. We keep our eyes on Jesus. So that means we spend time in the Word. So if you have time to spend on your favorite sports team, if you have time to watch the games, if you have time to listen to the sports talk, you've got time to be in the Word too. I invite you to dig into the Bible. Listen to the stories and see that continuing theme of God's love throughout the Word. Spend time at church. Okay, right now, we're virtual. We're in our comfort zones of our couches maybe watching. But what I'm getting at is be in worship because in worship, it's a practice of coming into the presence of God together with community lifting up praises, listening for God's Word, offering our prayers, receiving the gift of God's presence in the sacrament, and then being sent back into the world. Spend time in prayer. Prayer is that intentional quiet time where we open our hearts up to God to offer our concerns. It could be as simple as, oh God, help me. Jesus Christ, have mercy upon me. To those deeper prayers of listening in quiet for God's still small voice. If you're not comfortable praying, spend time praying. That's how you'll get comfortable. Spend time serving beyond yourself. Get out of your comfort zone and actually put your hands to it. Get involved. We're going to be having a Feed Galveston event coming up in which we're going to be packaging food because our neighbors are hungry. The numbers are not good. More people are in need than before. Maybe that's one of the places for you to plug in. Be generous. Don't live a life of scarcity, of hoarding, but be generous and give it away. Starting to get the idea? As we follow Jesus in our lives with these practices of what Jesus has done already, we too are being formed and we are being transformed. We're being transformed into the children of God who are filled with goodness and love and mercy and hope. What's forming your life? I believe Jesus is calling you to be formed even more by Him. Amen. After we gather in prayer, having heard God's Word and come before the Lord, we exchange the peace. This ancient practice of reconciliation, of overcoming our differences, extending a hand in greeting and words sincere of the heart, peace be with you. In these days, it's a little difficult to do that, but we're doing it in a new way. We're inviting you to pass the peace beyond the walls of the church. It might be at the grocery store 
when you're going through the line, everyone's got a mask on, and the attendant there is really tired, that you're able to give a word of peace. It might be to your neighbor, someone that you've not gotten to see for a while, but you get to see and say, hey, peace be with you. I pray that for you and your household. There are ways that we can impact our neighborhoods, our families, our communities by passing the peace beyond our walls. We're inviting you to be one of those agents in doing just that. So, of course, you can write a note. You can text somebody or email. You can even call them. But this week, pick three people. Pass the peace beyond the walls of the church. After we pass the peace, we then move to the time of the offering where we receive gifts that we're offering to God's use through the life of the church. Again, it's a little hard to do that, but we can. Your support has been essential to helping us get through these most different of days and to help expand our ministry reaching more people and being able to touch more hearts with God's love. You can give by going online and using the online icon there on the website to donate through the website. You can go to your own bank or credit union's bill pay and have them issue a payment to the church. Or you can mail it in old school so that we receive it so that we can continue doing the ministry God is calling us to in this time.